morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the September 3rd Thursday Web Forum. As always, I'm Hillary Morris. I work on Blueprint User Support and Communications in the South Atlantic. And for the last several years, we've been hosting this Web Forum every third Thursday of the month here at 10 a.m. And it's intended to give folks like you a chance to ask questions and help provide input to guide the conservation future of our region. So. We're following the usual agenda. I'll start by introducing our speaker. We'll hear for 30 to 40 minutes about the month's, this month's topic. There will be plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. I'll give a quick preview of what to expect with next month's webinar, and then wrap up with some updates from South Atlantic staff. So today we're going to be hearing from Amy Weldon, who's the coordinator of the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture, or ACJV for short. And she's going to be talking to us about the ACJV's flagship species approach for conserving their focal ecosystem, salt marsh. So um, before I put us all in silent mode, I just want to remind you that you're able to use the chat box if you have any questions throughout the talk. I'll keep an eye on that and can try to jump in and ask those, or you're welcome to hold them until after the presentation, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, anyone want to speak up before I put us in silent mode? All right. The conference is now in silent mode. So with that, Amy, you're welcome to take it away. Just hit star six to unmute your line, and you're welcome to grab the presenter power. Great. Everyone hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay. All right, I'm just grabbing the ball here. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, looking good. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks for giving me the opportunity today um, to do the third Thursday webinar. Um, I think I recognize most of the names on the list. Um, there's a few that I don't, um, but for those who don't know me, I coordinate the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture. Um, and for those who are not familiar with what a joint venture is, um, there are 23 joint ventures across the country, and um, they all <clears throat> focus on bird conservation, um, choosing the conservation issues of their choice and the, and the focal birds of their choice. Um, the joint, our joint venture is um, a partnership of 17 states and territories that range from Maine all the way down to Puerto Rico, and it includes um, partners from all the state wildlife agencies in those states, a variety of federal agencies, um, bird conservation NGOs like Audubon and the Nature Conservancy Ducks Unlimited, and academic institutions as well. And Everyone on that joint venture has a shared commitment to restoring and sustaining native bird populations throughout our whole region. Um, so we are a really big joint venture. We're one of the biggest joint ventures in the country, and also a, both in terms of the amount of area and geography that we cover, but also in terms of the number of states that we have in our joint venture. So 17 states is a lot of states to coordinate, and this sort of north-south south um, axis of our joint venture means that there's a lot of different habitats that range all the way from tropical mangrove grove habitat all the way up into kind of boreal forest habitat as well. Um, so that's meant that over the years, you know, we've had to evolve to be more strategic in order to meet the highest conservation priority needs in our joint venture. So just a little bit of history about the joint venture. We were founded in, in 1988. We were one of the first joint ventures in the country. And our focus at that time um, was primarily waterfowl and, and um, specifically black duck. And we were founded as in part to help implement the goals of the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. In 1999, all the joint ventures across the country decided that um, we should expand our focus to become all bird. And um, that doesn't mean working on every bird, but just that we have the opportunity to work on conservation challenges that affect more than just waterfowl um, and that we could ex expand the entire range of taxa within, within, within birds. Um, and so that led us to focus on a lot of different things that were all really important and it really expanded the reach of the types of partners that we were working with, but it also kind of resulted in us trying to do too much for the amount of capacity that we had and for the geography that we had. So in 2016, our joint venture really made an effort to narrow the strategic focus 
of what we were doing and um, with the specific goal of really moving the conservation needle in a measurable way on something. And that meant, of course, giving other things up um, to be more strategic and, and ensure that we were actually being successful. Because if, prior to that, we didn't really have a way to measure how successful we really were and what successes we could attribute to the joint venture in terms of um, those successes being greater than the sum of their parts. So what is the joint venture? what was the joint venture doing that was greater than what the individual states and entities within the joint venture were already doing? And so we wanted to make sure we were moving in that strategic direction. So basically we moved from quote unquote all birds in theory to just a few birds um, through a species prioritization process. And um, this was driven by our management board who said they wanted us to come up with a much more narrow focus and charged us with finding a way to do that. And so we developed a process over um, that took probably the better part of a year that included um, our full technical committee, which is all of the management board entities, um, folks representing them at the technical level, our management board entities, which are uh, more of the folks in the, the leadership and decision-making positions, as well as the full range of bird conservation partners. We, can, we, we engaged everybody that we could in helping us figure out what our priorities should be. And then we took those uh, a kind of narrowed set of priorities to our board retreat and over the course of three days kind of hashed out what we thought was the most important priority for our joint venture to be adopting. And where we landed is this coastal marsh focus. And the reason that we chose this focus out of all of the other worthy habitats and bird conservation and, and bird species out there was because this was a habitat that was a shared priority for almost all of our board members. We we weren't there was no habitat that would include everybody, you know. Um, so we were we were probably going to lose a couple partners here and there, um, but that was just kind of the the nature of the game. Um, but most of our board members saw themselves, and, and in some ways you could even argue that all of our board members could see themselves in um, this habitat uh, that we selected. We also selected it because of its conservation priority. Um, the, the birds that, are, that occupy the salt marsh system especially are specialists and their populations are declining. Almost all of them are declining. Some of them are precipitously declining. And so there was some urgency around this, this suite of birds in this habitat that we decided there was some need for coordinated, more need for coordinated conservation attention. A lot of our partners were already working on these species, but they were confined to their state boundaries and there was a recognition that we really needed to be able to work in a coordinated fashion and come up with um, objectives across the, re across the range of some of these species in order to be successful. So that was the reason we chose this habitat. And then we, we drilled down even further and decided that we would like to focus on um, achieving success through, fla uh, through a flagship species lens or a representative species lens. And we chose three species to represent our um, priority habitat. And these species are the ones you see here, the salt marsh sparrow, the black duck, and the black rail. And we chose them for a variety of reasons. Um, the salt marsh sparrow and black rail are probably the two most imperiled species in the salt marsh system. Both of them are experiencing a 9% per year loss in their populations, and they're um, you know, projected to be moving toward extinction unless something is done um, to change that trajectory. So they represent the, piece, the part of the marsh that is considered to be the high marsh, which is the, the one that is irregularly flooded only on the highest tides. Um, and they're experiencing greater nest inundation due to sea level rise and then getting squeezed from the landward side from development. Uh, the black duck was the third species that we chose, and this species um, represents our low marsh habitats. So collectively, the three species together represent the entire system. They also um, represent our geography really well, with the black rail being more of a southeastern specialty species, the black duck being found largely in the mid-Atlantic, and the salt marsh sparrow being confined their breeding range to the northeast. Um, and we also have a land bird, a water bird, and a waterfowl species. So these species really work well on a number of different levels, and everybody seemed pretty happy with that selection. So then our next steps once we selected these species were to set um, measurable objectives to, to be able to say whether or not we've been successful. Um, oh, and here, I, I, this is sort of the represent, representation graphically of where these species are within the marsh system with black ducks being the low marsh and then um, black rails being in the highest part of the high marsh and also um, in other habitats as well. 
So we basically went from working on many birds in many habitats, potentially, to working on three birds in a single habitat, and those three, with those three birds representing a much larger suite of birds that also occupy those habitats. Um, so then our next steps here were to um, set these measurable objectives. So we needed to set time-bound and measurable population objectives for each of our species. And then we, our goal was to set habitat objectives to achieve those population objectives. Where do we want to do this work? How many acres of what kind of habitat do we need? And then um, provide tools and resources to our partners um, to help advance implementation on the ground to achieve both the habitat and the population objectives. So um, these are the, the three population objectives that we set for our flagship species. Um, with the black duck um, being that we, we set that we wanted to protect or re restore or maintain a sufficient habitat to support a million non-breeding ducks. For the black rail, our goal was to, pr to support a sustainable population of at least 25 breeding pairs of black rails. And then in the, for the salt marsh fair, our goal is 25,000 individual birds. And there's a lot of detail behind these objectives, and so I'll just give you two examples using our salt marsh sparrow and our black rail. Um, so for the salt marsh sparrow, this is the trajectory of their populations from 2012, which was the most recent population estimate, um, out into the future to 2031. And so we decided that it was completely impractical to set a population objective to maintain what we've got today based on the the pressure of the threats that this species is facing, there was no way that we were going to be able to maintain that number of birds. So it's sort of an odd thing, but our population objective is less than the population is today. So we're shooting for something less than we've got today, just based on the reality of, of marsh loss. And so our goal is the 25,000 birds, which is projected with these numbers. These numbers have actually been updated since a new paper was just released, and so we need to bump these up ever so slightly. Um, but using the, these, these numbers where this graph was based off of, we should hit 25,000 birds in just a couple of years. Um, so our first goal in the short term is to protect enough land to support that, that number of birds. And a lot of the salt marsh is already protected. And we estimated that about 21,000 birds are already supported on protected land. And so that meant we needed another 4,000 land for another 4,000 birds of high quality marsh not just any marsh, but high quality marsh. And so um, our partners at the SHARP program, which is the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program, helped us crunch some kind of back of the envelope um, numbers and decided that to support 4,000 birds, we'd need at least 7,000 acres of additional high quality marsh. So that's kind of the short term goal, the, the very short term goal. And then our midterm goal is to stabilize the population and make sure we're experiencing population growth rates in enough marsh patches that the population either maintain, is stabilized or is um, growing. And so we want to make sure that happens before 2029 because we don't want the population to drop before 10, 000, below 10,000 birds because at that point it becomes very unstable and susceptible to stochastic events that could um, really reduce genetic diversity and cause extinction risk. And so during this kind of 10-year period, our, you know, this is when we'd be really working hard with our partners to do a lot of habitat restoration, work on figuring out how to facilitate marsh migration, determine if that's even a viable strategy, work on nest inundation prevention, and a whole host of other things, kind of pulling out all the stops. And hopefully if that's successful, then um, we'll continue to do that and continue to grow that population back up to our goal. Um, so that's, that's kind of our thinking for salt marsh sparrow. Similarly, we have a similar phased approach for black rail. Their populations are in much um, more dire straits. Uh, this shows the population trajectory from about 20, from now based on 9% per year declines and the goal of stabilizing those declines by about 2024-ish um, to prevent the population from dropping below 300 pairs. Um, because below that is is a genetic, what we're assuming to be a genetic bottleneck. And then working um, over the next 40 or 50 years to restore that population to uh, the 2,500 pair goal that we set. 
which we are considering to be a minimally viable population of black rails. And this was these these um, estimate or these objectives were all developed both for the Salt Marsh Sparrow and the Black Rail through a collection of folks that on our working groups that all have expertise in these areas. So those are our population objectives, um, just some examples of them. Um, and then the next step is to develop these habitat objectives. And so uh, just a couple examples here um, using the black duck and our salt marsh sparrow next. One of the tools that we've been working on is called the black duck decision support tool. And right now we've only got the data for um, the northeast, but our goal in the future is to expand this into the southeast. But what this is showing is the um, the the Huck 12, Huck 12 level, which is kind of like the, a small watershed level um, of goals and priorities for black ducks, with the darker reds being the highest priority for restoration and the darker blues being the highest priority for protection. And if you kind of dig into it a little bit more, um, and zooming in like this is an area in Virginia and Maryland around the Chesapeake Bay, and showing the kind of a zoomed in version of the hucks where you can see that the reds are restoration and enhancement where there's not enough food energy to support our population objective. The blues are where areas where there is enough food energy, but it's not, not enough of it is protected in order to have long-term sustainability for black ducks at our population objective. And then the green ones are where there's already enough protected areas, protected land, and enough food. So the goal there should be to maintain what we've got and make sure that we don't lose it. And if you click, if this is an online mapper, um, I could send the link to anyone who's interested. You can click on any of these individual hucks and it'll tell you exactly how many acres of restoration or protection are needed in that huck to meet the goal. Um, for salt marsh sparrow, we've done a similar prioritization tool where we've worked with our working group to develop a model that shows the highest priority based on biology and a number of factors that are important to sustaining long-term salt marsh sparrow populations um, across the range. And so if, this is also online. You can find it on our website, on our salt marsh sparrow page. Um, you can play around with it and, and see where things kind of fall out on the landscape. But the darker the red color, the more important, higher priority those areas are for um, maintaining salt marsh sparrow population. And there's a lot of factors that go into that, like you know proximity to development, ability for marshes to migrate, resiliency of the site, and those sorts of things. And then the last tool that is in development right now is uh, our salt marsh conservation business plan. And the draft is currently out for review. Some of you have probably seen it if you're on our technical committee or were involved in the planning workshop a couple years ago. If anyone would like to see it and comment on it, I'd be happy to send you the link. It's a Google Doc, and you can um, see the most recent version in real time. Um, so this business plan is um, it spans the joint venture region, including the Florida Gulf Coast, all the way up to Maryland, all the way up to Maine, and it identifies a set of strategies and actions that are necessary. Um, to conserve the entire suite of salt marsh specialist birds. And it does identify three highest priority species, two of which are our joint venture species, the black rail and the salt marsh sparrow. And the strategies in the plan focus first and foremost on those three highest priority species with the assumption that any strategy done for those in most imperiled species is going to benefit the entire suite of salt marsh birds. But there are another 20 or 25 birds that are part of the plan um, that, you know, over as the plan evolves over time and species needs and threats evolve over time, the strategies will as well. Um, so please let me know if anyone would like to have a copy of that for review. So then the final kind of piece of our joint venture process is um, implementation. All joint ventures. Um, all habitat joint ventures are focused on implementation. And so that's what all of these tools and plans are really driving us toward. And so this is a really good example, I think, of how those tools can be incorporated into real world implementation on the ground. Um, this is a map of the black duck watersheds that I showed you in a couple, a couple slides ago. And the dark black outlined hucks are areas that the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation has identified as high priority water quality hucks. And so we did, um, they approached us and asked us if we could help them 
incorporate Habitat for Black Ducks into their water quality objectives for their new business plan, which just uh, was finalized, I think, in August. And so we were able to look at their priority hucks, look at our priority hucks, and find those areas that were priorities for both of our, um, for both of our values and come up with um, wetland specific, like wetland type specific, how many acres of each type of wetland in those hucks need to be restored or protected to meet our goals, and also at the same time be meeting water quality goals for NIFWIP. So this is gonna directly translate into more funding on the ground for both black ducks and water quality through the National Fish and Wildlife Funding Priorities. So that's one, I think, really great example um, another thing that everyone here is probably very familiar with is the, the North American Waterfowl Conservation Act, or NACA. This is something that is ongoing, something the joint venture has been doing for years and years. It's a major source of conservation dollars in our joint, ven in, in our joint venture. Um, we've spent more than $57 million since 2014, um, which leverages another you know, $154 million in match. And these are actually, this was prepared for another presentation, so I'll give you the, uh, the history, the, the, full, the full scope of how much um, habitat has been protected through NACA. All of these are NACA projects, all these dots in the map are NACA projects, and so since the very beginning, we've um, protected more than 2 million acres and um, have leveraged, have, have spent more than $1.6 billion on habitat projects, and now that the joint venture has identified this flagship habitat and these species, that is um, part of the discussions now when developing the, the ranking recommendations for NACA projects um, across the joint venture. And then on a smaller regional scale, um, we have been working with NRCS and partners in the Delaware and Chesapeake Bays. Um, to get a new NRCS Working Lands for Wildlife Initiative for black ducks off the ground. And so we used, they used the decision support tool to identify the priority areas that they wanted to invest their NRCS dollars in black duck conservation. And um, since then, we've been able to leverage the, just the sheer existence of the initiative, we've been able to leverage that to get additional funds um, to do more work in this region. So we, uh, with partners in the area, were able to secure grants to support a two-year landowner outreach position um, in this area of the Delmarva, which is something that's just getting off the ground now. There's been a person hired to do the work and basically go and knock on doors and engage landowners in cost share programs through NRCS and other programs. And this leverages existing work that Ducks Unlimited was already doing in this orange circled area on the map. And then they were able to um, get an, a third position. Um, oh wait, sorry, that's, that's, that's backwards, I guess, we're out of order. There's a, the, the orange area is where the new position was created um, through Ducks Unlimited and the existing work was already happening in that blue circle there. So because this, this Working Lands for Wildlife initiative was developed, basically we were able to get two more kind of landscape level projects, outreach projects off the ground to engage more landowners in doing work that benefits black duck and that benefits the salt marsh system as a whole. And then there was another grant that partners were able to get through NIFWIF to protect um, 1,000 acres of, of priority black duck habitat I think this property is in Virginia, if I remember correctly, um, but another way that those that initiative has been leveraged and the Black Duck tool has, was used to help identify this as a, one of the highest priority parcels. And then for Black Rail, um, one of the things that we're doing is trying to get a series of pilot projects off the ground to test some management tweaks that might be beneficial for creating um, and attracting black rail, quality Black Rail habitat. And this is an example at Jahasi Island in the Ace Basin National Wildlife Refuge in South Carolina. It's an impoundment, a coastal impoundment. And um, the light areas are the areas that um, theoretically have good black rail habitat, and the dark areas are areas that are probably too wet for black rails. And so a number of partners in that area were able to um, secure some dollars, I think, from the partners program. And put in some um, different water control structures that allow them to manipulate the water levels so that the right vegetation could 
um, could grow to create black rail habitat in this entire, I think it's 200 acre impoundment. Um, so we, we're trying to get a lot of those different projects like this off the ground because for black rail, the situation is a, is a big unknown. Like we really just don't know what works and what doesn't. We have ideas about what works, but the population is, is declining so rapidly that um, you know, we need to just as, as, just as rapidly be out there learning and trying to figure out what works best where so that we can um, disseminate that information to, to managers on the ground to be doing that kind of work as quickly as possible. And so, you know, we're trying to get some of these projects off the ground in, in four different states. We're looking for more projects like this um, to try to accelerate the pace of our learning as it relates to black rail management. So if anyone's got ideas or thinks they have places where we could do this kind of work, especially in Florida or South Carolina or even Georgia and North Carolina, um, definitely come talk to me or Craig Watson about uh, these ideas. And they don't have to be very expensive. Some of these things can be relatively low cost, um, but could provide a lot of useful information for us. And then these last two slides are just kind of things on our wish list, things that we really want to do um, hopefully as soon as possible that we're hoping to find resources and part willing partners to be able to do it. Um, like I said, with the black rail, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns about how to kind of best conserve the resiliency of the marsh system as a whole. And one of those, and this is more relevant for salt marsh sparrow than anything else, but probably the whole system as a whole for the future of the marsh system, is how do we create that the, the marshes of the future and facilitate marsh migration into areas where there currently isn't marsh. And we'd really like to identify, you know, through an experimental design, a series of pilot projects that test out different techniques for facilitating marsh migration, like, you know, clearing trees or clearing trees and removing them, killing trees and leaving snags, um, you know, killing trees with, by flooding them out with salt water, working on ag lands, is that better than working in areas where there are forested, um, forested buffers around marshes? All of those things are big questions that we are still really interested in, in learning the answers to so that they can be disseminated out to partners who are interested in doing that kind of work. And for the black rail, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially on ag lands, because this bird isn't restricted to the to salt marsh systems. They can be in a whole variety of wetland systems, and they don't necessarily need a whole lot of habitat, and they seem to be able to find good habitat if it's there. And this is a slide um, set of pictures from uh, some California black rail work where they have um, done some artificial wetland creation in ag lands and had a lot of success in attracting rails. And, this is just an elevated pipe that is just kind of dripping water um, down a slope, and that slope has been um, converted to more wetland vegetation, and now it's occupied by black rails. And so they've had success doing that kind of work in a variety of kind of pocket areas around the landscape, and that is where the black, California black rails are being found. So we think there are opportunities to do this kind of work on the East Coast as well at relatively low cost and maybe even using existing infrastructure because um, it really doesn't need a lot of water. Sometimes it's just sort of a constant trickle of water is necessary to create the conditions that black rails like. They, they really don't like a lot of water anyway, and these slope systems seems, seem to be attractive to them because the water can't get very deep on a slope and it yet it, it grows the right sort of density of vegetation that they like and the right invertebrate population. So these are some things that we'd like to move forward with and are looking for more um, interested partners to help um, us develop some of these ideas. Um, so that kind of sums up, I think, the whole like nature of where the joint venture is going, has gone in the last couple of years, where we'd like to go. And um, I am totally willing to answer any questions people have about any of that that I just uh, threw at you. Awesome. Thanks. That was a great presentation. I'm going to take us out of silent mode now so we can do Q&A a little bit more easily. The conference is now in talk mode. So now you can just manage your mute from your phone, so please be mindful and mute if you're not talking so that we can hear any of the questions. Um, who wants to jump in with a question for Amy? Hi, Amy. This is Mallory Martin. Hey, Mallory. Got a question for you. And, and by the way, that was an excellent overview. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, you guys are doing some really strong work. That's uh, very impressive. 
glad to see that. Um, Thank you. I had a I had a question about in your population and habitat objectives, and you mentioned the uh, marsh migration uh, experiments there toward the end. But how how do you account for those um, those threats of future change uh, in the population objectives? Um, how how are you working around that? What do you mean by how do we account for the threats? The future well, changes. Well, if uh, if habitat is going to be changing over time. Uh, but you've got static uh, estimates of how much habitat is needed to sustain those oh. populations. You know, is that uh, because of the time frame that you're looking at, roughly a 10-year time frame, that um, you're anticipating that, that those changes won't be that significant? Um, but I, I expect that there would be some things like urbanization in some of those areas around the Chesapeake that are some really pretty, some, uh, you know, pretty strong immediate kinds of threats yeah and that's a really good point and I, I should emphasize that right now the population objectives are based on the landscape snapshot as it is um, so in the salt marsh conservation business plan there is a much more detailed analysis of kind of what needs to happen like that 7,000 acre goal is number one 7,000 of the very best acres today and in and relies on those same 7,000 acres being maintained in high quality, which isn't realistic. So realistically, we'll need probably a lot more acres than that, but we haven't figured out yet how many more acres that would entail. But what we're really kind of shooting for is that we have sufficient acreage on the ground, and there's state-by-state -state breakdowns in the business plan of how many acres each state would need to maintain 25,000 birds. Um, but it has to be kind of a shifting mosaic of habitat in that those acres have to be creating positive population growth if we're going to maintain those 25,000 birds. And if some of those acres start dropping off and aren't creating positive population growth, then we're going to need more acres. Um, so it's not in the static, it is not incorporated into the static numbers now, but I think the reality is that we're going to need more acres than that. We just haven't yet figured out how to kind of measure a shifting mosaic of high quality habitat. Yeah, th thanks for that. It's a really difficult kind of thing dealing with changing landscapes, no doubt. Yeah, very. Anybody else have a question? Thanks, Mallory. Hey, this is Ben Carswell. Um, I'm at uh, Jekyll Island State Park in coastal Georgia, and uh, I, I think the answer to my question is probably uh, that nobody knows. But I wonder if there's anything more you could say about black rail, uh, black rails in coastal Georgia. Black rails in coastal Georgia. Um, I don't think there are any. Um, Craig, you're on the phone, right? I thought, I thought I saw Craig Watson in the in the list. He's yeah, on the list. I'm here. I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'm, I'm here. I was just taking the uh, phone off mute. Oh sure. So the black rails in coastal Georgia. There, the last set of surveys did not find any in Georgia, right? That's correct. So they've been done okay. the last two years, and none have been found. Right. So that's not to say that we can't get black rails in coastal Georgia. I think the future of these pilot projects is going to kind of help us determine where we can build more rail population centers. Um, I'm not, I don't know if they're not in coastal Georgia because there's a lot more low marsh there than in some of these other areas where we have these kind of rice agriculture remnants where you can create the right habitats in these impoundments. Um, so South Carolina has a lot of that. Georgia has less of that. Um, so I think, a lot of the future of black rail is going to be in these more inland systems. And I and I think we can create those conditions, but we have to figure out what those conditions are and what works. And my guess is that's what's going to be the future for black rails in Florida. There's, there's definitely a camp of people out there that don't believe that we can maintain the black rail in natural tidal systems in the long term and that the future of black rails is going to be moving into these artificial systems like impoundments or artificial wetlands on ag lands. Um, so that may be where things need to go in Georgia. I'm not sure. 
Thanks. Another great question. We still have plenty of time if anyone else wants to jump in. Hey, Amy, this is Dean. I uh, have, probably have a question along the same lines, and maybe the answer is, is the same as was just offered to the previous question, but I was curious about the population objectives for the sparrow versus the rail and how one acknowledges the inability to sort of maintain status quo and the other recommends a many-fold increase at least at the at the 2050 goal level. So I'm curious when you translate that into habitat, if, if that just represents a difference in projected trends in habitat availability between the more northerly sparrow and the more southerly rail, or if it's also tied to what you just described as maybe the habitat requirements of high marsh for rails might be met in a different way than for the sparrow. Yeah, I think they're definitely going to be they have the black rail has a lot more options than the salt marsh sparrow. And so, you know, if we can figure out what options work, theoretically we can grow this population. They have pretty big um they have big clutch sizes and they are pretty good at pioneering into new habitats and so the idea is that if these population constraints are removed, then we could the population could rebound fairly quickly. Um, the sparrow is really constrained to these tidal systems where you know the problems are much more difficult to solve, and you know so it's it's a little bit trickier for that, and we're not expecting you know kind of the same trajectory. Um, but really, both of these birds are in kind of dire straits, and no one has the answers for either of them. But this black rail objective is is kind of the ideal. It's it's based on 7% growth rate per year. That's just kind of right in the middle of the range of um, growth rates for birds of this type. Um, and so we just kind of picked it because it was in the middle. But whether that's realistic or possible remains to be seen. Hey, Did that answer you. your question? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, thanks, Amy. Yeah, this is Bill. I have a question for you related to um, kind of the culture of the Joint Venture Partnership and the focus on these three species in the system. And, you know, kind of juxtaposing that with your um, table that you had of the uh, conservation actions that have been taking place through NIF with, um, I mean, NACA. Um, and, you know, is there, are, are partners willing to adjust their NACA projects and proposals to be very focused on these three species and, and habitats, or is there still that broader um, interest in, in NACA projects that go beyond these, these focal species? I'm going to let Craig answer that, but I think the answer is both. But Craig is much more deeply involved in NACA and sees the proposals and how they've changed over time. So, Craig, maybe you could chime in on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. So, um, Bill and everyone, so most of the NACA projects um, that we're getting funded right now are are mainly the same as we've had in the past. Um, what we do see is that applicants talk a little bit more about saltmarsh sparrow and black rail. And, you know, in the past they've always talked a lot about black duck where appropriate. Um so what we've seen is, you know, is we have a ranking committee within the joint venture itself that we, you know, submit to um, the NACA Council staff and Division of Bird Habitat Conservation. And our ranking committee does weigh um, NACA projects a bit more if they address our flagship species conservation efforts. But so it's yes and no. For example, this past cycle for NACA grants, there really wasn't any proposals submitted that were highly valuable to those species. So we saw what we got funded were a lot of forested wetlands projects. So it sort of depends on, you know, what kind of opportunities the partners have to, to develop a proposal in those habitats where, the, where we have the flagship species or not. So in, in other words, like Amy said, yes and no. But, I mean, it, it's, it's fairly new for us, so... Um, it, it may transition over time to where we see more of that. We just we just don't know yet. Great, thanks. 
Well, I hope that helps. It does. I know that's a that's a challenge. I I like the focus that the the joint venture is taking. It's but then it does get down to as um, Amy mentioned. You know, it's about the delivery and 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 really trying to turn some of these populations around. And that's going to depend on our our cultures, uh, conservation culture existing, but new partnerships willingness to move in those directions away from where we've right. done traditional work. Bill, this is Cindy Bone. Can you hear me? Sure can. Hey. Um, hey. I just wanted to let you know that the National Coastal Wetland Grant Program, which is kind of a sister program to NACA, and um, Craig's really involved in, in helping us, um, you know, get pick really good projects and giving us the information from the joint ventures. We're doing a lot of salt marsh restoration um, projects. I think there's probably two or three projects this cycle that's coming in. We've had two, three, four maybe in the last few years. So um, working with Ducks Unlimited, um, so that's like $4 million. So mostly this work is in North Carolina, South Carolina, but um, it is for black rail and, and for salt marsh restoration. And we're also putting probably about, I want to say, $300,000 of coastal program funding into doing restoration, maybe even more this year um, for black rail and for also some uh, other avian species a little further down um, in South Florida. So, um, we're really excited to have this kind of information because this is what, you, as you know, our service leadership is looking for to make sure that we're focusing on, on population goals and and contributing to the um, – and using the science and stuff behind where we need to put our projects. So um, a bunch of coastal program folks are on the on the phone. So if there's more information that we need or something else that we – um, can benefit from. We'd love to hear from you all. You know, also thinking about your question, Bill, the, and, and NACA, and what we're hearing about the potential for for delivering habitat for black rail in the future. It it could be, or at least it seems right now that that maybe NACA remains a better fit for salt marsh sparrow and American black duck. Whereas, if you're thinking about perhaps numerous small-scale little wetland projects further inland for black rail, that might be a much more complicated thing to try and pitch in the context of a NACA project. Yeah, that, that's right, Dean. And I think the other thing to think about here is we really don't know what to do for black rail yet. So I think, you know, over the next few years, if we can, you know, figure out how to grow black rail habitat and grow black rails through these pilot projects, then then maybe that can be translated into, you know, kind of more landscape scale uh, NACA type projects. But yeah, right now we just don't know really know what to do for um, black rail except for in some of the areas like the Ace Basin and, and in the, you know, the old rice field areas from North Carolina to North Florida, just continue to enhance some of those old rice field impoundments that do provide some of that habitat for rails. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Great discussion. Any other questions or comments? This is Bill. Just one one other thing and I, it's it's so far out there it probably doesn't matter, but I noticed that the next uh the next um Month's forum is identifying resilient coastal sites in South Atlantic and Gulf, um, and so it'll be interesting to see if there's a relationship at all, or, or a way to strengthen some of the relationships between the JV's um, efforts as it relates to at least this is the, the southern end, and what may be coming out of that from TNC. That's a great idea. Yeah, that'll be our talk next month, as Bill said. So um, that'll be Annalee and Mark Anderson from TNC given that talk. So it could be a good one for other folks on this call to tune in and look for good overlap and complementary opportunities. All right. 
right, well, it seems like the questions have slowed down a bit for now, so I'm going to take back presenter power and give you all a little bit more of a detailed overview of what to expect for next month and um, give another update from South Atlantic staff, but we'll pause for questions again at the end uh, if anyone else has a thought occur to them that they want to ask Amy or the group. So as Bill mentioned, next month um, our web forum is identifying resilient coastal sites in the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. That will be the 18th of October, same time, same connection information as today. And that will be Annalie Barnett and Mark Anderson with TNC talking about their project. So this is really getting into the need for coastal habitats to have space to migrate landward in response to sea level rise. Um, so this project is looking at potential barriers, human activities, and um, physical barriers that block the movement of those marshes and really disrupt our key ecological processes and our coastal systems. So Annalie and Mark are evaluating more than 5,000 sites in the South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. They're looking at um, migration size, migration space size, configuration, and tidal diversity, and they're looking for kind of those natural processes that are needed to support coastal habitat migration. So they'll be giving each site that they're analyzing a resilience score based on the likelihood that its coastal habitats will be able to migrate into lowlands um, under different sea level rise scenarios. So the project itself probably won't be finished until September 2019, so this is kind of an interim report, uh, a progress update. They'll present some um, draft results for the assessment of the various sites that they're looking at and talk about the condition attributes that they're examining and how they'll be mapping those over the coming months. So think of this as a little bit of a progress report on this project. I'm really, really excited to see um, what they have to say and probably will be a talk that's of interest to those of you who tuned in today. Um, and our staff update, I just wanted to give Mallory a chance to talk about the CAFWA annual meeting next month and some of the things that we'll be presenting from the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy, or CCAS. Um, Mallory, do you want to jump in here? Sure. Um, I, can, I can give a really quick overview of uh, where we are with CCAS and the upcoming the AFWA meeting, we're uh, preparing for that. It's uh, about a month off, and I think it's going to be in Mobile, Alabama this year. So if any of you in the southeast are planning to attend there, uh, be sure to look for us. We're uh, planning to have a display table there, and we're uh, planning right now on um, what kinds of things we're going to feature there uh, in terms of handouts and demonstrations and uh, engagement with uh, other folks who are attending that meeting. Uh, one of the other things that has been in development for the last year is an overarching goal for the CCAS initiative, and this uh, stems from a charge that was given by the Southeastern State Directors last year uh, for the points of contact from the, um, the Southeast, uh, the CCAS participants, uh, including the Southeast Natural Resource Leaders Group, the so-called SNRLIC uh, points of contact, and they've come together and, and developed a, uh, a draft recommendation for that, which, uh, by the way, we'll be taking to the um, CAFWA Wildlife Diversity Committee uh, on a call later today for some additional input from that group. But uh, we anticipate uh, taking that uh, goal, kind of an overarching uh, aspirational type of goal statement to the southeastern directors at this meeting. Basically, that goal is... Um, uh, calls for a 10% or greater improvement in the health, function, and connectivity of southeastern ecosystems by 2060. And so, again, a kind of a high-level aspirational approach that uh, tries to give a description for what the CCAS initiative uh, is all about. And it's complementary to the CCAS vision and, and designed to uh, provide a little different uh, additional communication uh, provide additional connections with some of the uh, non-traditional sectors who are target participants in this initiative, and and overall uh, giving us something to uh, to rally around and a and a targeted approach to to shoot for. A um, couple of other updates that we'll be featuring at that meeting will be the uh, updated version 3.0 of the Southeast Conservation Blueprint and the priority map. Uh, there will also be uh, uh, new threat layers that will be uh, in display and an updated website 
that uh, is in progress right now that shows some of the stories and features a story map of the applications for the Southeast Blueprint by users who are, who are using that to um, inform conservation decisions on the ground. We're also featuring um, increased user support for those users out there who are wanting to use the Southeast Blueprint and uh, need a little bit of uh, additional support in understanding how to make those kinds of applications. And we'll have some other things like uh, fact sheets and, and some other uh, renewed information on the CCAS initiative overall. So be on the lookout for, uh, for that. And again, anyone on the call who will be attending that meeting, um, be on the lookout for us there. Thanks, Valerie. Um, so I assume most of y'all are familiar with this idea of the Southeast Blueprint, which is stitching together all of the spatial priorities that originated in the LCCs across the Southeast and Caribbean. And this is the first year that we've been able to connect with a crucial habitat assessment tool coming out of the Western Association of Wildlife Agencies. And um, that's given us full coverage of the state of Texas for the first time. So this blueprint keeps getting better and better. And as Mallory mentioned, we have identified a user support lead for every state that you see highlighted on this map in the CAFWA, the CCAS geography. So um, if any of y'all on the phone feel like you want to use the blueprint, whether in the South Atlantic or across this broader Southeast region, um, there are people available to help you write your grants, make your decisions. Um, inform your priorities, whatever it is that you're, cha you're tackling, we're here to help you, and I hope that you will reach out to us. So with that, I always end on how to get more involved in the Blueprint in the South Atlantic. You can still join the South Atlantic LCC web community if you want to sign up for our monthly newsletter. It will also give you a monthly reminder email and invite to this web forum. Always encourage you to connect with your Blueprint staff. That's me and Mallory and Rua and Amy and Louise here in the South Atlantic, as well as all those great user support folks across the broader Southeast. And you can go online to explore the Conservation Blueprint both in the South Atlantic and the Southeast. Um, at this point, I'm going to pause again for questions and just see if anyone has more questions for Amy or for um, your Blueprint staff. No questions. Just thanks for taking the time, Amy and Craig and others, to work through this process and uh, fill us in on it. You're welcome. Thank you. Agreed. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Amy. It was a really great presentation. Appreciate you all tuning in. Um, if there are no more questions, let's call it a day. Um, thanks so much. Hope to see you next month for our Resilient Coastal Sites talk. I think it will be a good one. Bye, everyone. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.